أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما والذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما والذين يقولون ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساء مستقرا ومقاما والذين إذا أنفقوا لم يسرفوا ولم يقتروا وكان بين ذلك قواما والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون ومن يفعل ذلك يلقى أثاما يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك فأولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما ومن تاب وعمل صالحا فإنه يتوب إلى الله متابا والذين لا يشهدون الزور وإذا مروا باللغو مروا كراما والذين إذا ذكروا كِرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُّوا عَلَيْهَا صُمًّا وَعُمْيَانًا وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ وَجَعَلْنَا وجعلنا للمتقين إماما أولئك يجزون الغرفة بما صبروا ويلقون فيها ويلقون فيها تحية وسلاما خالدين فيها حسنة مستقرا ومقاما قل ما يعبأ بكم ربي لولا دعاءكم فقد كذبتم فسوف يكون لزاما صدق الله العظيم ما شاء الله جزاكم الله خيرا كثيرا إمام الشيخ إسماعيل الحمد لله ما شاء الله I think الشيخ إسماعيل has given us our lesson for tonight. Jazawala khaira. 
Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Furqan, Surah Al-Furqan is the 25th section of the Qur'an. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaitan al-rajim. And I think it's fitting because uh, when Sheikh Ismail was describing the qualities of Ibadur Rahman, of the devotees of the most loving, the most compassionate, the slaves, the devoted slaves, the slave servants of Ar-Rahman. Uh, Sheikh Imam Suhaib Sultan, he came to my mind. He came to my mind. And, and I, maybe he came to some of your minds as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَدْعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَنِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْعَرْضِ حَوْنًا وَإِذَا خَاتَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا السَّلَامَةِ The ibad, when you usually see the word ibad in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising those particular slaves. There's a difference between ibad and abid. Ibad is higher in rank, generally speaking, than those to whom, those who are referred to as Abid. They're both slaves, but the Ibad are slaves of Allah Ta'ala that embrace their Ubudiyah, that embrace their slavehood to Allah Ta'ala, and they strive to be in obedience to Allah. They recognize that Allah is their master, that Allah is their owner. Uh, earlier today, Imam Suhaib told me that may Allah give him healing, shafahullah wa afahullah, that he tells his body and all the cells in his body every morning, la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi la lilavi. And remember that there is no change and there's no power except through Allah, the most exalted, the Almighty. He tells that to his cells, the cells in his body. And this is a reminder that the cells that are in his body, those that are cancerous and those that are non-cancerous, they're all slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibadur Rahman al-ladina yamshuna ala ardi hawna. The servants... The of Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman is one of Allah's names, one of Allah's beautiful names that indicates His Rahmah, His compassionate love for all creatures. This is what the scholars say. Even for the disbelievers, even for the angels and for the jinn, even for the shayateen, for the plants, and the planets, for the suns and the stars, for the heavens and the earth, for you and for me. Allah's name, Ar-Rahman, it's that name that is all-encompassing of everything in the universe. And it indicates absolute and unlimited compassionate love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all creatures that's expressed through first and foremost his creating them from non-existence min al-adam and giving them the blessing of existence of wujud subhanahu wa ta'ala and so anytime you see a blessing that is given to all beings without any discrimination like the rain then you should think of Allah's name Ar-Rahman or when you think of air think of Allah's name Ar-Rahman uh, when you think of the earth the earth supports As-Salih wa Talih the righteous person as well as the corrupt person think of Allah's name Ar-Rahman these are all expressions of Allah's name Ar-Rahman. Then look at how Allah, subhanAllah, look at how Allah Ta'ala connects now the ibad, those servants who are willing, who are connected, who are willing and lovingly choosing to surrender themselves to Ar-Rahman. 
Ar-Rahman, Allah describes them as what? Those who walk upon the earth gently, hawnan. Those who walk upon the earth lightly. This refers to their humility. And mashallah, this is the first quality. Allah could have revealed Ibadu Rahman aladina yuqimuna salah. But the first thing that Allah begins with is what? Their humility. And as we mentioned on Friday, as we mentioned on Friday, uh, which was again a very important lecture about our amana, our responsibility as Muslims to do whatever we can to fight the uh, threat of climate change that's within our power that's within our own power Allah says yamshuna hawna, those who walk upon the earth lightly some of the ulama of tafsir say this means that they live on the earth lightly they don't damage the earth they don't abuse the earth they don't pollute the earth means that they are gentle in the way they live. Their, their, the impact of their, their lives and their living upon the environment is minimal. They are humble. There are people that don't destroy, don't pollute the earth. And there are people who respect others. They walk on the earth lightly because they know on this earth are the remains of generations, al-ajjal, those generations that have died already. And so out of respect for al-amwat, those who passed away, and how one of the poets said, walk softly, intelligent one. Because any place that you step on this earth, you're stepping on the dead remains, the decaying bones of people who lived before you. And so Ibadur Rahman, they're aware of the past. They're aware of the present and they're humble with everyone that they come into contact with. They treat everyone the same. They're humble with those who are older than them out of respect for their age. They know that those elders, that our elders have lived long in the obedience of Allah, that those elders have experienced so many trials and triumphs and have gained great wisdom thereby. They are humble with the elders, because these elders have worshipped Allah longer than you and me. And then they're humble with the children as well. Not just with the elders, but they're humble with the children. And even those generations that are yet unborn. Because those children have not disobeyed Allah as much as the elders have. As much as those who are alive now have, who've lived longer than them. And they are, pre- they are humble with those who are their peers, their colleagues, because they recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have forgiven others all of their sins, but we have no guarantee that Allah has forgiven us. They are humble with every person because they recognize that we are all from nafs, nafsul wahida. We all come from one, one self, one soul. We are all, as Allah, as the Prophet said, Kullukum min Adam wa Adam min Turab. All of you are, for, for, are from Adam, Ali salatu wasalam. And Adam came from the soil. Adam came from the soil. Adam Ali salam came from the soil. And so because we recognize that we are all united in coming from the soil and the nature of soil is to be what? Humble, to be hayyin, 
to be easy. And when the ignorant address them, either khatabuhum jahiluna, when those who have no uh, bounds, those who have are uncouth, those who are harsh, those who don't have any boundaries, when those who are without proper manners, people of su'ul adab, when they address them, they say to them what? Salama, peace. He's Al-Badu Rahman. And throughout our lives, there will be people who maybe address us harshly, people who treat us harshly. Sometimes within your own home, sometimes in your workplace, sometimes on the road, people say things or do things to you that make you feel bad. The response of those people that Allah Ta'ala praises here and Allah loves these people is that they respond to that harshness with calm, with honor, with peace. They are peacemakers. May Allah make us from the peacemakers. وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّادًا وَقِيَامًا and they are people who they spend their nights for their master, their nurturer, their teacher, their Rabb, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, prostrating and standing. Uh, this is their second characteristic. Notice again, the character, Allah praises them for their character, their khuluq before he praises them for their tahajjud, their qiyamul layl. And notice again that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something about Abad rahman They don't just pray. They pray at night. They pray at night when others are asleep. And these are times when it should be easier to pray at night, shouldn't it? It should be easier for us to pray at night. Many of us are at home. Many of us don't have to commute an hour or two hours to work. Many of us, mashallah, we are living in comfort in our homes. So set your alarms, ask your husband, ask your wife, ask your children to wake you up. Maybe 20 minutes before Fajr, 30 minutes before Fajr, an hour before Fajr if you can, right? Or more so that we can receive the blessing of being described, of realizing some of these attributes. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا إِسْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمَا إِنَّا عَذَابَهَا كَانَا غَرَامًا Those who say, our master, avert from us the punishment of hell. Indeed, its punishment is ever adhering. They seek refuge in Allah Ta'ala from Jahannam. They beg Allah Ta'ala to protect them from Jahannam. إِنَّهَا سَأَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا Indeed, the hellfire, Jahannam, which is also Gahannam. If you've been to Jerusalem, uh, there's a valley called Gahanna. It's this, it's where they, in the olden days, the ancient days, they would take the trash and they would burn it. Right? Some linguistic scholars say this is where we actually get the word Jahannam. This is where the Arabs and the Yahud and the Jews, this is what they described as Jahannam before Quran was revealed. Right? And it's even mentioned in parts of the Bible, Gehenna, the valley of Gehenna, the valley where a fire, this is where people would burn that which is of no use anymore, that which was diseased, that which would cause corruption. They seek refuge in Allah from that. This is the third quality. They are people, look at now Allah is describing their financial attributes. 
the Quran covers everything. So first, this is their character with people. This is their character with the planet. This is their character with the animals. Like Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi, Rahmatullah said, if you think you're better than a dog, there's still arrogance in you. There's still takabur in you. They don't think they're better than anyone for any reason. And then Allah describes that these are people, they get up, they get up at night, they, they, they pray, they prostrate, and they bow. They, they prostrate and they stand in the night, in prayer, in salah, in namaz. And then now Allah says, and when they spend, they're not extravagant. They don't waste, nor are they stingy, but rather they're economical. Qawama. Uh, Allah says, Wa kana bayna dhalika qawama. They're between just being a spendthrift, just wasting money. And the believer doesn't waste anything. May Allah make us all believers. May Allah make us Ibad Rahman. The believer is very economical. The believer is frugal. The, but the believer is not stingy either. The believer is not someone who is tight fisted. The believer is balanced. And may Allah make us people of balance. May Allah Ta'ala make us people of balance. They are moderate. They spend some of their money. And and there are basically four or five things we should be doing with our money. No matter how wealthy you are or how uh, uh, um, austere you may be living without means. Some of your money you should spend on your needs and the needs of your family and the needs of your community some of your money, and even if it's just one quarter, you should spend something on others besides yourself. That is what we call charity, sadaqah. And then there's some money that you should invest. Invest in your business or save so that you can invest in a business at some point in your life. The Prophet Sallallahu he praised at tujar the people of business. And then some of your money you should save so that if there is some emergency, then you are not a burden on anyone else. You have some money saved up over time. Some uh, financial experts say you should have six months to 12 months of savings of your monthly expenses. And may Allah Ta'ala make that easy for all of us. And the fourth thing is you should enjoy some of your money. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. I mean, spend it on your family. Go have ice cream or buy gifts, uh, you know, but without being extravagant. Ex without being extravagant. This is the way of the believer. Some on charity, some on investing, some for savings, and then some for your enjoyment. But again, buying only what's halal, what's permissible, buying only what's tayyib, what is pure and wholesome, and then not being excessive. And inshallah, the last thing we'll end with here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now describes them, There are people who don't call on any other God besides Allah. Allahu, and they are not, they don't murder a soul that Allah has forbidden, meaning they do not take a life unless it is just and legal and religiously permissible. And they do not fornicate, they do not commit adultery. They don't commit adultery with their privates, they don't commit adultery or fornication with their eyes, or their ears, or their tongue, or their hands. They only uh, have intimacy with someone that they are in a halal, religiously, Islamically permissible marriage. 
and that is it. Right? These are the believers. These are the people who Allah Ta'ala praises. And whoever does that will suffer the consequence thereof. And alhamdulillah. We'll stop there, brothers and sisters. And inshallah ta'ala, you know, again, when I heard uh, Sheikh Ismail reciting this, it made me think of Imam Suhaib Sultan, and I think it's appropriate, uh, mashallah. Um, I want to, again, we'll open up for about five minutes or so to see if there's any questions or comments. Um, generally, over the next few days, we have about uh, 10 days or so before Ramadan. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking about different aspects of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala, how to prepare for Ramadan this year. Uh, part or all of Ramadan will be done uh, at staying at home, right? If the stay at home order is still in place. And so how do we make the most of that? You know, how do we take benefit from this? One of my dear beloved elders was telling me yesterday, that Allah has blessed us with this stay-at-home order because usually it takes about 40 days to form a new habit. Some say 21, but I think really 40 is closer to reality. And if you use this time, and if I use this time to cultivate these qualities of Ibadur Rahman that we've just discussed, and I encourage you, go to Surah Al-Furqan, the 25th Surah of the Quran that I've been reading from, and read from Ayah 63 to the end of the Surah and make a note of all of these different qualities and attributes. If we can take these 40 days that we have been, at, as we've stayed at home, many of us, not all of us, but many of us, at the end of that 40 days, before you go into Ramadan, you'll be a new person with new habits, with a new routine. And you go into Ramadan able to build upon that. Ramadan will give us another 30 days without shaitan. With the shaitan locked up. With the shaitan al-jinn locked up. That you can now build upon what you've cultivated, inshallah, during this time of stay at home. Where you only have yourself and maybe your family to deal with. As opposed to the entire world influencing you and as long as you are uh, mon monitoring what you watch and what you listen to on your computers or your phones or your televisions and not allowing any filth into your eyes any filth into your ears any filth into your heart by the time ramadan is over you will be a, a salih you'll you'll be a righteous person if you're not already and if you're already a salih then you will increase increase in darajat and so we'll stop there, inshallah. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, with your families to read the remaining ayats describing these incredible people, Ibadur Rahman. Inshallah, if there are any uh, questions about, again, about what was discussed tonight, then I'll take those. Uh, mashallah, we have quite a few people on, over 50 people, mashallah. Uh, mashallah. Thank you, Brother Zen, for sharing the uh, surah and the ayah, Surah al Furqan, which is the surah of discrimination or cr the criterion, meaning discrimination between truth and falsehood. It's the Furqan between the uh, light and darkness. And uh, Al Furqan is one of the names of the Quran. Al Furqan is one of the names of the Quran, mashallah. And uh, the great companion, Umar al Farooq, anhu, Umar ibn al-Khattab was called al-Faruq because he was such a human being. He had internalized this. And how many times did the Qur'an, how many times did the Qur'an confirm Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, his judgment, mashallah. So it's right that he was called al-Faruq. Uh, Sister Farah, wa, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Are you going to continue this also in Ramadan too? Yes, we're going to continue our classes in Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. But in Ramadan, my focus will be on giving a summary. Uh, really, I, I don't even want to use that word anymore. It is uh, sharing some of the lessons of each juz, uh, each night of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. So that will continue. 
really, you cannot summarize the Jews uh, in, you know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And most people don't have time for more than that. Um, if you want to do a, 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 sum, a Jews, it's justice to really summarize it. You're talking about 20 pages, 20 pages, right? You at least need an hour, I would say, at least an hour, if you want to actually do the, but you know, again, most of us don't have uh, patience for that. May Allah increase us in patience. You know, we don't, we don't have hour, you know, people um, like to spend Ramadan listening to the Quran uh, and praying Taraweeh. And I, and I want everyone to pray Taraweeh at home. Don't just listen to Sheikh Ismail recite Quran. You should establish the Salah, Qiyam al-Layl, Taraweeh in your homes, brothers and sisters. Right? So start preparing now. Who's going to lead the prayer in your home and, 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 and whatnot? Uh, that's very important. Uh, or who will share that responsibility? Uh, in your home. The, the Messenger of Allah, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Man qama Ramadan imana min The one who stands in the nights of Ramadan seeking um, with faith, with iman, seeking the reward of Allah Ta'ala, all of their past sins are forgiven. And so siyam and qiyam are really the hallmarks, the distinctive acts of worship of Ramadan, fasting during the day and standing in prayer during the night. Whether or not you have a sheikh or an imam to lead you, whether or not, and you recite whatever you can from the Quran, even if all you know is Surah Al-Fatiha and Surah Al-Ikhlas. If that's all you know, that's fine. That's fine. And whether you want to pray eight rakahs with witr, or 20 rakats with witr, it's okay. Whatever is easy for you, but don't leave out qiyam in your home with your family. Mashallah. And uh, some of you have kept asking, uh, some of you keep asking about praying through the internet, and as uh, the answer has not changed, <laughs> and it won't change because of the number of times you ask, and it won't change because of a fatwa from once this scholar here, this scholar there, as I've already said, 98 or maybe even 99% of the scholars who've written about this subject, 99% of them say that prayer is not valid, right? And as an imam, my responsibility is to guide you to what is the most reliable, dependable, religious opinion. Just like if you went to a lawyer or an accountant or a doctor, and you ask them for their opinion, would you want the doctor to give you the most fringe opinion out there just because it's the most convenient thing for you? Is that what you would want? And so again, the overwhelming majority of scholars from all the different schools they say that a person should be in the same uh, space as the imam and the congregation so that they can either see and or hear the imam or a member of the congregation praying with the imam. And that's what most scholars say. Yes, I am aware that there are a few opinions of scholars now and until uh, there's uh, evidence that uh, that until there's evidence otherwise, then the safest opinion, I think, is and I think also what's closer to the Sunnah of the Prophet sallam is that you pray uh, with someone who you can hear and see with your eyes and with your ears, inshallah ta'ala. And yes, it does mean you have to work a little bit. But I think one of the silver linings in this stay-at-home order is that it's causing us to have to take greater personal responsibility for our deen. And that's a good thing, brothers and sisters. It, that's a good thing. It's a good thing to take personal responsibility for establishing uh, Islam in your home. Uh, it, the Prophet ﷺ gave us the tools and the teaching to do that. And Allah Ta'ala, we ask Allah for, to, for his help. 
Masood Ansari, salam, how does hoarding fit into this context, which is very befitting to the current events? So uh, a Muslim should never hoard. You should store. So storing and hoarding are not the same thing. Storing means uh, or what is called in Arabic, iddikhar, right? You, you st store what you and your family need for your uh, physical well-being and your mental, emotional needs. Uh, hoarding is when you take more than what you and your family need and thereby deprive others of sufficient provision for their needs. And what's even worse than that is buying up, like some people have been doing, they went to all these different stores, bought up all the hand sanitizer, all the masks, all the toilet tissue, and whatever else, right? And they're selling it for exorbitant prices. This is hoarding and price gouging, and that is absolutely forbidden in Islamic law, in Sharia. And so there's a difference. So hoarding is not befitting uh, in these circumstances, but storing is. You should store. Uh, Imam al-Ghazali, radiallahu anhu, mentions that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi was prepared for every circumstance. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was prepared for every circumstance. That's the level of preparedness he was for life. Are you and I prepared for every circumstance? Right. Good or bad. So part of the sunnah is following that sunnah of being prepared. And sometimes when you speak to Muslims, and I know because I've been speaking to a lot of Muslims about emergency preparedness over the past month, and a lot of Muslims, they don't know what that is. And when you explain to them what it means to have emergency preparedness, they're not interested. They're not interested. And so if you don't know what that is, it, it's, it simply means that you have enough food, you have enough medicine, you have enough water, so that if you were not able, for example, to leave your home for 30 days or for three months, right? Uh, you would be able to do so. And some um, emergency preparedness uh, even goes for a whole year. Right? We know, and we know, and our scholars, you know, uh, I'm not talking about doing some of the more <clears throat> extreme emergency preparedness. You have enough food for 25 years. Right? I'm not talking about that. But we know from hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu <clears throat> that for some of his wives, he would store provision for a year. He would store grain for a year for them. But a lot of times, because so many poor people would come to him and his wives, they would give it much of it away in charity before the year was up. So alhamdulillah. Uh, Sister Noor, uh, we're, we only have three minutes left. Inshallah. Yeah. Assalamu as alaikum, Imam. This is Noor Alisha, not sister. Oh, brother Noor Alisha, alhamdulillah. How are you? Fine. Uh, I yes. just have two two quick questions. Sure. One is uh, is Salat Taraweeh Sunnat al Muqida, and the second question is uh, if the person who is leading the Taraweeh prayer can hold the Quran and read from that, is it allowed? So I don't know if any of our Hanafi scholars are on the line, but in the Maliki Madhab that I studied, it's not Sunnah Muqida. Taraweeh is not. Sunnah Mu'akkadah in the Maliki school. Um, I could look it up for you, inshallah ta'ala, in the Hanafi school. Uh, let me just take a quick look here. Bismillah. But if Sheikh uh, Yusuf Hussein or Sheikh Umar Mir are on, I would welcome them to, or anyone who studied Hanafi fiqh, with a scholar. If you want to write in the chat or chime in, I can answer. Okay. Uh, 
There we let's see. Okay, according to what I'm seeing, mm -hmm. uh, let me see if there's a Hanafi. Okay, here we go. Let's see. All right, this is a Hanafi website that's very well respected. IslamQA.org. Mm -hmm. IslamQA.org. And uh, the... Bismillah. Let me see what the answer is. Okay, yes. Tarawih is a sunnah mu'akkad salah. Okay. Yes, not just a nafil salah. And thus, there is a set number of rak'ahs for it. Just as the number of rak'ahs are set for other sunnah mu'akkad salah. For example... Mm -hmm. Two before Fajr, two after Dhuhr, four before Dhuhr, etc. Uh, Bismillah. While Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah is of the view that no amount has been stipulated, there exists ijma uh, agreement of the ummah, of the community of the Prophet yes, right. that Tarawih is not less than 20 rakats. From the time of Umar radiallahu anhu until the fitna of not following a school of law started there was no masjid in the world where less than 20 rakats of tarawih was performed. This was the practice of the ummah uh, for about 1,200 years. According to the Hanafi madhab, no salah is permissible reading from the Quran. According to the other madhabs, it is permissible. Okay, bismillah. Um, and that's from uh, Sheikh Hussein Kadodia from the Fatwa Department uh, Again, this is a South African uh, website of Hanafi scholars, uh, inshallah ta'ala. So in the Hanafi madhab, it is Sunnah Mu'akkada. And um, it should, again, uh, it should be done with the intention to give life to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu yeah. Alaihi follow his Sunnah. Uh, you asked again about holding the Mus'haf as he rightly said in the Hanafi madhab, uh, holding a mushaf is not permissible in salah. The only exception would be if, uh, according to some scholars, is if you needed it to recite al-Fatiha. For maybe someone who's just entered Islam and they need to read al-Fatiha for their fart. Mm -hmm. So there are scholars that allow someone to look at the mushaf or uh, some paper to do their fart, but not for mm -hmm. the nafil. Uh, it is permissible in other madhabs. So what I would suggest uh, is number one, you, you could do, you could just recite what you have memorized. Yes. Um, it's fine. Iqra'u ma tayassara min al-Qur'an. Right? Iqra'u ma tayassara min. Recite what is easy from the Qur'an. That's all. You don't have to recite al-Baqarah or Ali Imran or Hujuz like a Qari. Just recite what is easy, no matter how short it is. But um, we, is it possible we can mix and match two madhab? Yes, it is. So the <laughs> second thing I was going to say is the Hanafi madhab is just a madhab. It is not the deen. Yes. It is uh, not Islam. Right. Uh, uh -huh. And so if, and, and this is uh, a, a matter of khilaf, of difference of opinion. So if uh, you feel comfortable and you have the need to read from the Mus'haf, then read from the Mus'haf. And like the other madhabs say, there's no problem with that. And we should not be rigid. We should not be inflexible or dogmatic about these issues of difference of opinion, brothers and sisters. Uh, even with the number of rak'ahs, like I said, he says 20 rak'ahs. But again, uh, when you look at the evidence, the Prophet Sallallahu did not set a number. And even in the time after the Prophet Sallallahu in the time of uh, the Salaf, the Sahaba, and the Tabi'een, and the Tabi Tabi'een, the people in Ma of Mecca, they pray 20 rakahs. And between every four rakahs, they would make tawaf around the Kaaba. They would oh, encircle the Kaaba. But wow. in Medina, there was no Kaaba. So instead of, uh, you know, uh, uh, what they would do instead, uh, they would add an additional four rakahs. So in Medina, oh. Uh, after the death of the, after the passing of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they would perform thirty-six rakahs of tarawih. Mashallah. Yeah, <laughs> and in some of my teachers, like in uh, in Yemen, 
Habib Omar, may Allah preserve him, Habib Omar bin Salim bin Hafif, uh, mashallah, they uh, perform 20 rakahs, but they recite not one juice, but two juice. Mashallah. Right? Every yeah. night. Mashallah. And then, yeah. and then after they finish 20 rakahs with Habib Omar, many of the brothers and sisters, they go to another masjid and perform another 20 rakahs. And then after that, they go to another masjid and <laughs> perform another 20 rakahs and then witr. So they wow. end up performing 63 rakahs every night. Mashallah. So don't, yeah, yeah. yeah inshallah. What's important yeah, like is yeah, like that, yeah. I'll just yeah. say this, what our mother Aisha radiallahu anha said is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. he used to perform, uh, there's one narration, 11 and another 13. Every night, even in Ramadan. So, uh, to follow the Sunnah, brothers and sisters, I would say don't do less than eight plus witr. And if you want to do more, uh, then Bismillah, do more. May Allah bless all of you. Thank you for your questions and for your attention. And, and please uh, keep everyone here in your prayers. Let's make a short dua and um, and we'll give salams to one another. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين اللهم اشفي مرضانا وارحم موتانا وفك أسرانا وعافي موتانا اللهم رب العظيم رب العرش العظيم اشفي أخانا سحيب سلطان بشفائك أذهب البأس رب الناس وشفي إنك أنت الشافي لا شفاء إلا شفاءك اللهم اشفيه شفاء عاجلا تاما لا يغادر الصقم ولا ألم وصلى الله على سيدنا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم آخر الدوان على الحمد لله رب العالمين uh, ما شاء الله just uh, quickly before we close with salam uh, a brother أختار says some scholars say even the reading must be done by looking at a mushaf and not a cell phone because other things can pop up at any time like a text message or an email please comment on it so that's a good point and it also just one other important point about reading from a mushaf so if you have a, a, a mushaf number one i want to say if you are going to read from a mushaf brothers and sisters and it's not um, a mushaf a copy of the quran that's on a stand in front of you but you're holding it in your hand, make sure you don't disrespect that mushaf by laying it on the ground, as you see some people do, all right? So you want to keep the mushaf in your pocket or you want to hold it in such a way that uh, you don't put it on the ground, but make sure also that in your sajda, your hands touch the ground, all right? So um, you want to not disrespect the mushaf by putting it on the ground. Secondly, you don't want to have too many movements of putting the mushaf, you know, down and picking it up and turning pages. Just be very, 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 very efficient and use as few movements as possible because too many movements uh, in the prayer takes away from your khushu, your stillness in the prayer. And then to answer the question about the cell phone, um, while it is permissible to read the Quran from a cell phone in the prayer, as Brother Akhtar is saying, disable your notifications. Disable your notifications. Put your phone on silent, okay? Uh, even uh, I would suggest uh, doing whatever you can to prevent people calling, you know, uh, so that you're not distracted. So this is one of the things that the scholars caution against is uh, if you're going to use a phone that you should be sure that you're not distracted in the salah. Your salah, your heart and your mind should be focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, getting close to Allah, asking, begging from Allah, repenting, turning back to Allah and not your friends, the memes and the gifts and all text messages about what you need to do or what you didn't do from your boss or from your family members or your friends. So that's a very good point. Jazakumullah khairam. Ah, yes. Thank you, Sister Naila. Put it in airplane mode. 
Yes, put your phone in airplane mode. That solves everything. And, you know, that's the, I think everyone knows what that is. You just put it in airplane mode, alhamdulillah, and you uh, won't get any, any data. And that way your mind can be at ease. May Allah bless you. Jazakumullah khairan for that. And uh, we'll, we'll close with that. Uh, we'll go, I'm going to unmute everyone now.